I want to talk a little bit about a legend in the wrestling business, and that is Antonio Inoki, who passed away on October 1st, 2022. Um, a real legend. And I want to discuss Inoki and what he's done to the business and what he's done for the business and why he's such a legend. So him passing away marks the passing away of one of two of, of 80s and 90s pro wrestling in Japan, uh, Godfathers. You've got Antonio Inoki and Giant Baba. Giant Baba passed away, I believe, in 1999, and Inoki passed away now. These guys obviously were responsible for New Japan and All Japan. Before them came the real Godfathers, which would be Ricky Dozan and Carl Gotch. But um, Japanese wrestling would not ever be what it is if it wasn't for Antonio Inoki. Antonio Inoki did everything to try to legitimize pro wrestling. Obviously, for many decades, people knew that professional wrestling was not on the level, that it was, you know, uh, predetermined, so to speak. But he did his best to try to legitimize pro wrestling in various different ways. And for decades, this man was really the head of New Japan Pro Wrestling and put a lot of very important people in the wrestling business people and gave them pushes people who would be considered legends everyone from guys like big van vader um to guys like uh the great muda masahiro chono shinya hashimoto um you've got guys like tasumi fujinami uh even guys like great sasuke who didn't didn't really make his name for anoki but definitely worked with anoki a few times of course one of the biggest the biggest, I say, wrestling show ever, although it is with an asterisk, as far as attendance goes, would be the Collision in Korea show, the Wrestling Peace Festival, headlined by Inoki versus Ric Flair. And so, uh, this man, if you don't know, look it up. Now, I do have a podcast, a wrestling podcast called the K-Fabulous Lucha Brothers Wrestling Show. And on that show, I discuss professional wrestling with my partner, Brandon Draven, my co-host. Um, what happened is he took a trip across the country, and then I got stuck with the hurricane, so we haven't been able to record a new episode. But I'm pretty sure we'll have a new one up this week, very soon, to discuss like all the happenings in wrestling, including the stadium showdown, AEW show, what's going on with that, the Extreme Rules show, uh, with WWE and sort of where things have been going in that direction as well as the passing of Inoki. I'll leave a link down below to the iTunes. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review. Um, but uh, it's a fun show and we have archives going back years reviewing classic shows and discussing the wrestling business. Anyways, let me get back to what I was saying. So, Inoki, probably most known outside of Japan for having his let's be honest, legendary match, legendary match with Muhammad Ali. Now, was it a good match? No, it's actually pretty terrible, but it was something that was a time capsule for both professional wrestling as well as boxing, as well as this little sport that wouldn't even be called a sport yet called mixed martial arts because... Inoki was always big on shooters and grapplers, and actually that wound up being something that he would kind of overuse in the early 2000s to literally kill New Japan Pro Wrestling for years until the Tanahashi Okada era. New Japan Pro Wrestling was in deep shit for a very long time because of some of the booking decisions that Inoki had made, all because of his quest to legitimize his guys, and he wants to make himself legitimate, so because of that, you've got these realistic pro wrestling matches that are obviously worked, but they're meant to be real, and the crowd is kind of in on it, but they're also sort of wanting to believe, and you have this sort of hybrid style, this kind of shoot wrestling style, and Oki can work several different styles, but, you know, that Muhammad Ali match was viewed by tons of people, and it's not, like I said, it's not this great, great match, but it is legendary for what it did. MMA wasn't even a thing back then. This guy, Inoki, kind of had his finger on the pulse of what MMA would become, including what it would become in Japan in the late 90s, thanks to another one of Inoki's guys for a time, Nobuhiko Takada, you know, and what they did with Pride Fighting. So, 
Inoki, you know, we saw him on WCW television in the 90s. We saw him on WWF television in the 80s. The dude had a non... It's not an official title run, but he was WWF champion. He beat Bob Backlund, I believe, but it was it didn't count on the record books. But, I mean, he was a champion. And uh, if you don't respect Inoki for what he did for wrestling, I mean, this guy's a legitimate legend in every sense of the word. Like, people in Japan... This man was a, was a politician in Japan. Like, people knew who he was. He's famous around the country. And people here know who he is. But if you don't want to respect him for what he did... You also got to respect him for who he brought into the business. I mentioned the names earlier, some of the guys that he pushed. But one of the big mistakes that Inoki made, one of the criticisms is that he kind of hyper-focused on the MMA thing. In the 90s, you had the rise of UFC. And it wasn't really as big as it would become in the 2000s. But UFC began taking the sport called Valetudo. And making it more mainstream. Now, obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot to that story. I'm not going to go into the entire story because there's a lot of ups and downs with that. But uh, people began to notice that that there were shoot fighters out there that weren't boxers, they weren't kickboxers, they were real wrestlers, but also knew different styles of martial arts. And it, it was first called No Holds Barred. Later, it would become mixed martial arts. And what happened was. Inoki started to book shooters in the New Japan company, but he would also book them to sort of shoot on their established stars. The most famous story, of course, being Naoya Ogawa and how he straight up shot in the middle of a worked match on Shinya Hashimoto numerous times. And Hashimoto was one of the big draws in New Japan at the time, and that began the downfall of New Japan when that happened, along with... um, Inoki's bright idea of taking some of his guys like Yuji Nagata and having them go up against legitimate shooters like Mirko Krokop and Fedor Milanenko, both of which knocked out Nagata in seconds. Inoki's idea was, my guys are legit, so I'm going to book them up against legitimate tough guys, not realizing that even though Yuji Nagata was an accomplished wrestler, even though there were legit guys in New Japan who were tough, nobody can argue that, right? Fujita's another one, you can't argue that. Um, Inoki having them beat up his established stars and then having those same guys get clobbered in shoot MMA fights, all it does is kill your company because in the eyes of the Japanese public, they lost respect for these pro wrestlers that had been built up as being legit when they were getting destroyed by legit MMA fighters. And that would, of course, in, in a way, Inoki doing that would lead to some of the biggest years in Japanese MMA with Pride Fighting Championships, a company that Inoki sort of accidentally got off the ground in a way because he fed his guys to it. And as a result of that, while Inoki was still booking New Japan, he would often appear and be respected at these Pride Fighting shows. You know, he often showed up there and he had this infamous thing where he would slap you in the face out of respect like what Regal did back at Revolution to Moxley and Bryan. Inoki's done that for years where he'll slap you in the face and it means that he respects you. It's like the whole, you know, fighting spirit thing. But that whole style, that sort of Japanese tough guy fighting spirit, you know, we have no fear, Inoki was a big part of that. And so Inoki kind of became a tassinute to um, pride. Then he started this company called the Inoki Genome Federation, which was like a hybrid of pro wrestling and MMA. Inoki always had a lot of different ties to MMA and to uh, pro wrestling both. Because in Japan... Wrestling and MMA are both branching off the same olive tree. So they view both sports as the same, even though they know that one is legitimate and one isn't. You know, um, still, like, it's sort of viewed in this sort of fighting spirit. Either you're telling the story of fighting spirit or you're actually showing it by fighting against tough guys. So, you know, that to me is, is... you know, you have to really understand Japanese culture and understand what he meant to that culture, you know. Um, and some of the guys he trained, I mean, I mentioned already Chono, and I mentioned Naoya Ogawa and Takada. Also, he trained Ricky Choshu. He trained um, 
uh, Fujinami, I think I mentioned him, Hashimoto, Shinsuke Nakamura from WWE, he helped train him, uh, Keiji Muto, the great Muda, I mean, this guy, Hiroshi Hase, Akira Maeda, he trained so many different guys throughout his career, and so, he, he did so much for the business, and yes, he made his mistakes with pride, everybody can acknowledge that, he made his mistakes with feeding his fighters to or his wrestlers to shoot guys and embarrassing wrestling for many years in Japan. But still, the dude is maybe one of the most recognizable, if not the most recognizable Japanese pro wrestler of the past 50 years. I can't think of another one that's... I mean, dude, Okada is well-known. Obviously, you know, you've got Nakamura and all these guys, but Inoki is like legendary. Like people who don't, who who aren't even wrestling fans know about Inoki. MMA fans know about Inoki. Oh, boxing fans know about Inoki. He crosses so many different genres and we lost him and you know, it's tragic, but I'm sure we'll have more to talk about on the KLB when we drop that episode. So make sure you subscribe to that on iTunes. I'm out of here. Take care. And uh, R.I.P. Inoki-san, man. He's slapping somebody in heaven right now. We'll talk soon.